Welcome to Wales Tech Week 2021. Thank you to our partners. Enjoy the session. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Professor Steve Conlon from Swansea University, and I'll be chairing the session this afternoon on harnessing the potential of genomics and diagnostics to improve health, well-being and prosperity. I'm joined this afternoon by Dr. James Abbey from Tradition Venture Partners, Stephanie Wilbram from Perkin Elmer, and Corinne Squires from the Life Science Hub. We've got uh, four good talks lined up, and then we will move on to a panel discussion at the end of the session. So I'm going to kick off and talk about Wales delivering global genomic and diagnostic solutions for the first 10 minutes, uh, and then we'll go to our other speakers. So Wales has a precision medicine programme. It was supported by NHS Wales and established recently in 2019. And it's set up to capitalise on technologies to advance areas across the precision medicine portfolio. But first, if we consider what is precision medicine, um, we can define it as approaches to more individually tailor patient management for disease detection, and importantly, for the selection of improved individual treatment pathways. And through driving research and innovation, the new technologies in the areas of precision medicine are permitting a much better understanding of diseases, which will flow through ultimately to patient care. In Wales, there are two elements around precision medicine. One is integrated diagnostics, ultimately trying to identify disease earlier and maybe as far as going to prevent it. And then advanced targeted therapies. We have a lot of new therapies coming online, some of which we're starting to see realised in Wales. So envisage that these two areas can transform health services, drive research and innovation, and also establish further strategic partnerships with those companies that are developing new technologies and how we can implement them in Wales. The two areas of integrated diagnostics and advanced targeted therapies are taking place across four themes, four cross-cutting themes in precision medicine that have been established under that platform. The first is Advanced Therapies Wales, and this includes cellular and gene therapies, as well as novel biologicals that are being developed in some of our universities. The Advanced Therapies Wales programme had a very early success um, when it was able to, through UK Industry Strategy Challenge Fund um, support, establish an advanced treatments, therapies treatment centre in partnership with um, the Midlands. This treatment centre, which is between NHS Wales and industry, has very quickly led to the introduction of Wales's first CAR-T treatments in cancer patients. And there are a number of other advanced therapies, cellular therapies, as well as gene therapies, that we hope through these centres, which require very advanced levels of care to bring benefits to patients very quickly. The second platform area is in digital pathology. This is where we're looking at dig digitalizing the whole pathology workflow. Um, so particularly around image analysis of, of patient um, pathology samples using computational approaches. And indeed in, in my lab, we're developing approaches using complex cancer models, co complex cancer models derived from cancer cells from patients, developing the algorithms that we then hope to be able to put out into the use of on clinical materials. Imaging services across Wales in, forms the third area of the precision, precision medicine initiative. This has included setting up a national um, imaging academy, uh, as well as developing future pet imaging services, and, and how we can use these high resolution images coupled to new computational approaches to really help reduce variability in, in diagnosis from these, these whole patient imaging. And the fourth area is Genomics Partnership Wales, and I'll focus more on genomics for the rest of my talk. So Genomics Partnership Wales brings together a number of partners and stakeholders across Wales to ensure genomic technologies are implemented to fully exploit their potential to revolution national medicine. And we're seeing a huge explosion in genomics really across the globe. And genomics really can be defined into, or is falls into three main pillars, which align with the UK's genomics strategy and implementation plans that were released over the last year. 
first area is human genomics, where we're looking at whole genome sequencing. And in Wales, this is led by a single service, the All Wales Medical Genomics Service, um, where whole genome testing as well as, as gene panel testing takes place. The second area is pathogen genomics. And we have a pathogen genomics unit, which has worked incredibly hard over the past 18 months, really going in and sequencing um, thousands of, of COVID-2 samples, COVID SARS samples, and really understanding this disease and the variants that we're seeing across Wales. And the third area that we're starting to pioneer in is functional genomics. This is looking at how the, the genome is, is activated, how it's switched on or switched off. And here we're looking at RNA and gene expression analysis using new technologies, such as ability to, sync, to sequence the, the RNA in single cells. And spatial analysis, where we can overlay pathology samples with RNA expression across that piece of tissue and, and recognize that as well as the tissue um, being formed of different cellular components, the expression of genes within those cellular components is different. The second area is, is epigenomics. This is how the, the genome itself is activated or, or turned off. And this, this is a big area of, of growth, both in terms of diagnostic potential so our, our genome is um, fairly static. We do get some mutations in it, but the epigenome is very dynamic, responding to environment and even to, to drugs so we can modulate gene expression. And, and using these functional genomics pathways, we're also investigating how they may be taken forward in service innovations, working together with All Wales Medical Genomics. We do a lot of this work partnering with industry and, and we've done that for many years, looking at the development and exploitation in functional genomics. If we consider some of the technology platforms that we work closely in Wales with Illumina, who are the providers of the, the next generation sequencing platforms that are used in the, in the All Wales service, these platforms um, are very suited to functional genomic analysis. We're working with a, a relatively new company, 10X Genomics, on the single cell and spatial transcriptomics I mentioned. And within Wales over the past years, we've worked with Poor Bear Sciences, a filtration company based in North Wales, where we've developed disruptive technologies for epigenomics analysis. And more recently, we've started to couple epigenomic analysis with cellular analysis. And here we work with G Healthcare, who are now Cytiva, where we're creating 3D cancer cell models and probing the epigenome in these. So they're technology platforms. We also have partnership programs that, that operate in the functional genomics space. And, and these have really benefited from the Smart Expertise Wales programs um, that have been supported by Welsh Government that bring together academic and industrial partners. Two examples here that we're working on in Swansea. One is a project called RISE. This is a two and a half million pound program, which is exploring exosome technologies with IG Innovations. This is a, an antibody company based out in West Wales, which is part of the Abbott Group, and Renuron, who are a, a, an advanced therapies company based in Pencoid, who are developing um, exosomes for therapeutic uses. And we're targeting those in the diseases that we work on in the lab, ovarian and endometrial cancer. The second project is, is SIET. This is the Cluster for Epigenomics and Advanced Therapeutics. This is a, a six million pound program working with six partners developing antibody drug conjugates and evaluating epigenetic drug libraries as novel therapies in those two cancers, ovarian and endometrial I just mentioned. And here we're using functional genomics pro approaches working with GSK um, to probe novel drug libraries and antibody drug conjugates we've developed in a lab in Swansea and working with a company in North Wales by Victrix who are developing bispecific ADCs. And our ambitions to develop a centre for functional genomics in Southwest Wales in partnership with Swansea Bay Health Board and Genomes Partnership Wales. The final partnership example I wanted to mention is with a new startup life science company, Continuum Life Sciences, who approached us because of our expertise in functional genomics with a very um, important question that they'd identified, and that was why do some people survive cancer and can that knowledge be used to help other cancer patients. We've adopted our functional genomics uh, approaches and applying them into immuno-oncology in both immune cells and exosomes. 
I want to end on the consideration of big data and data analysis. The genomics data that I've mentioned across genome, functional genome and pathogen genome creates huge data sets. These require large scale computational approaches to analyze the data. And we do that through the use of infrastructures that are available in Wales, including supercomputing Wales to perform this data analysis. And really with the continued growth in data sets in the research and innovation environment, it's the only way we're going to tackle this is through the use of supercompute infrastructures. The use of artificial intelligence in this area is going to continue to explode. Um, it's going to be pivotal in the development and application of genomics approaches. And we're exploiting Wales's new AI um, system called Accelerate AI in Swansea, which is an Atos NVIDIA computational capability where we're integrating functional genomics and advanced imaging data that ultimately will use allow us to look at patient diagnostics and drug development. And finally, how do we connect all this through digital health records where we want to integrate this genomic data? And a great example is here is the Welsh Government supported Secure Anonymised Information Linkage or SAIL database, which I'm sure many of you have heard about, which is starting now to integrate in genomics data from, from patients. And this will ultimately lead to clinical decision making in providing a much more personalised um, healthcare uh, analysis for that patient. Understanding the genomic profile of an individual and linking it to the pathology of their individual de disease will lead to more tailored treatment and improved patient outcomes. So in summary for what I want to say is Wales is really pioneering and driving forward in the area of precision medicine. And the, the vision is that that will go on to form the foundations of a very modern healthcare system, driving improvements that are happening in research and innovation, and that will ultimately come through to patient practice. So a, a very brief overview of what we're doing in the genomics um, space and how we're integrating that with, with other approaches in Wales in this really exciting area of precision medicine. Good, so I want now to hand over to, to my good friend, uh, Dr. James Abbey from Tradition Venture Partners. James is, is based out in, in Houston, in Texas, and I've had the pleasure of working with James for many years. James is going to talk to us about his views on collaborating with the Welsh precision medicine ecosystem, opportunities for manufacturing and research and technology development. So over to you, please, James. Steve, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And thank you for the opportunity to join you today. Uh, uh, Steve, I have to say I'm very fascinated by all the work that you've done there at Swansea. And I'm enlightened every day with the technology advances that are occurring in, in Wales, a small country that has actually punched above its weight in many cases. Um, as Steve mentioned, um, I've had a pleasure working with Steve over the course of several years, particularly while I was at Swansea University. Steve and I were able to develop a collaboration with Tex Texas um, and the rest of the UK for a program called the Texas-UK Collaborative for Bioscience and Nanotechnology. In that, we were able to develop not only um, programs that we had in Wales, similar to the Center for Nano Health and Institute of Life Science, um, but collaborate with other leading research institutions to complement and synergize to advance research and advanced developments. Um, it's fascinating to see, Steve, the work that you've done and where you've gotten to, because similarly over here in the States, we have the challenges that are running there in Wales, but exponentially much larger, um, and particularly within the context of where we sit today with the SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19. Um, the, the overall picture, if I look at this of why Wales and why collaborate is because Wales is a small country, easy to collaborate with. Um, I've spent several years there and have introduced several companies um, to the environment there and have been able to leverage those activities where we've been able to create fantastic outcomes. Um, additionally, also Wales is a great environment by which you can learn from. Uh, I have to say that in my passing and previously before joining Tradition Venture Partners, I was with the University of Missouri system where I headed up a $200 million precision medicine initiative and complex. And similar to the programs that Steve and the rest of Wales and the Life Science Wales have developed, we integrated all those into one distinct location where we baselined it into the data, the higher performance computing. 
We had the imaging correlating to that. We had the patient data. But one interesting thing was we had animal data. And the animal data that we utilized was to correlate that back to the human model, particularly in the areas of cancer. Um, those are opportunities that we saw in our programs that led us to build a foundation by which we could then develop therapeutics and drugs that were required for patients. And we utilized them within the health trust system that we had inside of the University of Missouri Health System. The opportunities there led us to create even more programs, similarly like was in Wales and is in Wales, collaborations that went international. And those were in areas of tumor boards and cancer uh, expertise that spanned both the globe and locations and brought in people that could address certain types of cancers where others could not geographically have that accessibility. So as we are joining here today, technology has allowed us to make these distances much smaller. Granted, um, being in lockdown so it makes it a little bit difficult and we amend ourselves to have to use different technologies to, to integrate, but the knowledge sits there. Um, and the ability to work with individuals like the group that I'm working with here and on the panel with allows us to actually collaborate in very innovative ways. Um, the ability to leverage both assets and intellect across the pond is critical. Uh, diverse populations and diverse uh, challenges affect everyone. Uh, a good example, of course, is where we sit right now. Um, it's been a global challenge, one that has uh, started from, a, uh, from China, of course, in Wuhan, um, with the outbreak there, the sharing of data there, uh, which occurred on uh, January 11th, where they uh, shared the sequence globally. And from that, we were able to collaborate globally and allow us to get where we are today to develop these mRNA vaccines rapidly in a time frame that we never thought we were able to do before. These technology advancements go to prove that we are able to accomplish things by working together, not only at a global scale, but even more so at a micro or macro scale, and particularly in countries that have these types of assets where others don't. One of the main um, things that we did when we were at Swansea, and I, I know Steve will agree with me on this, is that when we developed a collaboration, we did it in a way that we weren't copying or repeating work that was done previously. We complemented with the investment that we had. And what I've been able to see with what goes on in Wales is they've done the same thing. They've been able to identify the needs and the assets that are required and utilize the knowledge and the base of what they can achieve. And it actually has brought a lot to bear. Even more so, Wales has even pushed technology out. And I can speak to this as an investment in one of the companies that I'm working with. Um, in discussions with Life Science uh, Hub Wales, I was passed over a company that is based in Mexico. Funny enough, traveling to, traveling to Wales, looking to do uh, work over there as a rapid diagnostic, very innovative technology, utilizing uh, shark bodies uh, and uh, being able to detect COVID-19 with high specificity and sensitivity rapidly in less than five minutes and doing it via saliva. That technology in itself was interesting enough and of course relevant globally. The importance there was that it was passed back to somebody in the States and it was done by someone in Wales. That was very fascinating because what transpired next was a development and collaboration where now company that we've invested in Liquid3 is developing this technology hand in hand with uh, the groups uh, Unima based out of Mexico City. And we now are taking those technologies to Brazil for a phase three uh, clinical trial, which we rolled out in a matter of a few weeks. And we also have gotten uh, the emergency use authorization in Germany and the products also rolling out through those countries. So a small conversation in a small country, an opportunity to invite access individuals was led to a global output of a technology that once wanted to be planted in Wales and will surely return to be manufactured there. That's the criticality of what I see going on inside of Wales and the opportunities of working with the Welsh Assembly government and the universities there in Wales. And I, I, I like to speak from the, the point of view from Swansea because I have several years there, but Everest with University and also Cardiff University and several of the other universities have critical strengths that are required to collaborate both globally and they do. They're, they're representative of several technologies that are being developed and some of the people on the panel today will be discussing those things with everyone. And I think those are relevant. 
it's hard to do something in isolation, which we've all realized is very, very difficult to do, Not let, let alone raise a family or let alone homeschool the children or let alone collaborate, particularly in the areas of science that we're collaborating in right now. It's not that easy. But what's been very good is that the academic framework within Wales and the research framework in Wales lends itself to be accessible. And that accessibility and the ability to understand industry and the criticalities of industry has also helped to catapult opportunities outward and been able to actually educate those on the outside. Uh, a prime example is that I sit on a uh, panel that advises the CDC on uh, genomic testing for the different variants. Where do I look to? I look back to the UK and I look to Wales. Why? Because the criticality of that is that we see that what will be coming next more likely come from another country similar to us genomically and genetically. And with that, we can see what the propensity of that um, that different variant will be within our own population. That in itself is an opportunity to look at how you utilize high performance computing, both at the level of uh, genomics and genetics for individuals, and try to target those that need the most help and deliver a precision uh, solution at a point when it's most critically needed. It's fantastic to hear that the opportunities that are there in Wales and what's happening with sale. And I can tell you that that those things have actually propagated over here through an ability of someone like myself who has spent time there and seen what can be done through collaboration and working with different people at different universities and then translating that technology out. One of the things I, I'd like to end with, if I can, and I know I'm probably going a little bit short, Steve, so you can you can get me a little bit later, but we can get me on the panel if that's okay, because I, I honestly believe that the technology that's being developed today is giving us an opportunity to leverage what has happened. We've been able to develop a vaccine in less than 100 days. With the different variants and MNR, mRNA technology that we have currently in place, now they're saying that we can go even faster. Where we thought we couldn't go and would take billions of dollars, which I will say it does take quite a bit of money to do, um, but we've invested in that. And we've had that challenge and that challenge has allowed us and pushed us to do that. One thing we can be guaranteed is that a pandemic is not a one-time event. A global pandemic is not a one-time event. And now we need to be prepared for that by working together as we're doing it on this panel today and working with colleagues like we have here, Stephanie and Corinne and Steve, the opportunities that we have to collaborate outside and bring others together is critical. And I see that as the fantastic opportunity that Wales brings both to industry coming in to invest in that research and development, working with the knowledge base there, but also with the government and be able to access the government, the people that are making those decisions to do that investment and cap capitalizing on that to better the environment there, whether economically, scientifically, or research. I think that this criticality of what we're talking about today is just a foundation for things to come. Steve mentioned cancer. Cancer is another thing. Majority of what technology is being developed today in either um, PCR, RT-PCR, and other uh, genetic and genomic technologies, we'll be looking at past COVID-19. We'll be looking at these other things that are out there. We'll be looking at cancers and other diseases that need to be addressed, utilizing the same type of platforms that we're doing today. Whether it's rapid diagnostics in the field and be able to detect somebody is, um, is positive and then passing that information on to public health authorities or whether we're developing those technologies to assess a singular need for a singular patient that is specifically to them, to what their needs are and what their, um, their genome and genetics are. Those are the things that we'll be able to do. And I strongly believe that Wales will more than likely punch even more above its weight with the investments that they've done but more so with the people that is attracted for science and technology. Steve and, and everyone, I'd like to thank you for the opportunities to join you today. And uh, I look forward to the rest of, of the discussion and the panel. Thanks very much, James. Really appreciate your, your comments and especially how your Wales can be a real global player um, and in two ways, you know, things coming into Wales as well as things going out to Wales and, and the importance you know, that, that that partnership that we've seen grow between Houston and Wales is really a, a great example of the, the global connections, the global partnerships and efforts that have been made over the past 18 months in, in, the, in the field of science. 
Steve, um, if, you can, if I can add to that real quick, because you're absolutely right. From those things that we developed with the Texas UK Collaborative, they decided to uh, create the uh, Celebrate program at the Texas Medical Center. And now they have the BioBridge. And that allows for companies to easily access and gain access to different researchers and, and opportunities within the UK and specifically in Wales, which I highlighted, of course, with uh, the G7 summit that they had just a few weeks ago. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate it. Great. Thanks, James. Okay, well, I'm delighted now to, to welcome Stephanie Wilbraham. Stephanie is from, from Perkin Alma and they've done this tremendous job. And, and we're going to hear about the, the Lighthouse COVID-19 laboratory and, and partner, partnering for success. So I'll hand over to you, Stephanie. And welcome. Thanks, Steve. Um, can you see my slides? Yes, we've got them now. Yeah, perfect. Um, yeah, so as Steve said, I'm Steph Wilbraham. I'm the business development leader for genomic testing here in Europe from Perkin Elmer. Um, and today I just wanted to use this slot to kind of talk about um, the COVID-19 testing facility Perkin Elmer set up um, last year and kind of explore how a lot of the partnerships we'd actually built with the various teams in Wales actually led to the success of that um, testing facility. So just before we get into the project, I just want to give a bit more background about Perkin Elmer and kind of who we are and what kind of set us up to, to succeed with the project last year. So um, Perkin Elmer is a global diagnostics and life science company. We employ about 12,000 employees worldwide and we currently have about three and a half thousand patents. Um, and our kind of diagnostics portfolio is split up into different areas. So we focus on things like screening newborn babies for rare disease or um, genomics applications for cancer diagnosis or TB diagnosis. And then alongside the diagnostics division, we also have our life science division, um, which mostly makes products focused on the kind of drug discovery and manufacturing process. And a number of those products are actually made um, in Wales in Lantricent. So even before the pandemic, we already had a kind of Welsh connection. Um, and then alongside the kind of product sides of Perkin Elmer, there's also a few other divisions that um, kind of separated us from other providers and really set us up nicely to be able to deliver this lab. So um, alongside the products, we also have our informatics division. So this is a, a team that exists to create um, informatics products that can actually handle very large data sets that some of our instruments produce and help researchers kind of structure them and gain insights into the data they're producing. And then our enterprise team are a group that are focused on um, some of our global customers and supporting them in managing their existing lab network, because um, that can be quite a time consuming aspect of drug discovery. So we actually do that on their behalf and also deliver some basic scientific services as well. And then the, the final sort of part of Perkin Elmer I just want to highlight is Perkin Elmer Genomics. So Perkin Elmer Genomics is our, our service division. So a lot of our diagnostic and genomic products um, for customers that don't necessarily want to run them in house, they can actually send the samples to Perkin Elmer Genomics and we'll run them on their behalf. Um, and a lot of Perkin Elmer Genomics work is focused on diagnostic. So again, newborn screening of babies for rare disease, um, genome, and genomic applications for cancer diagnosis, whole genome sequencing and the use of that in diagnosing rare disease. Um, and it's really those kind of different elements that really set the Elmer up to kind of deliver the project last year. And then just going a bit more into Perkin Elmer genomics. So like I said, this is our diagnostic service division. So We've got, or pre-pandemic, we had nine labs spread across the world. Um, we've got labs in America, Europe, China, and India. Um, and they're very much focused on clinical genomics. And that clinical focus is part of what really set us up um, to do well last year, because not only did we understand, you know, setting up a workflow and a sequencing lab um, or a testing lab, we also understood what's involved from the clinical perspective, which is in many ways the more challenging perspective. So actually understanding all the regulation, what we needed to have in place, how we run a compliant lab, 
all of that aspect of things um, Perkin-Elmer genomics already brought us. And then going on to the project itself, um, <clears throat> so obviously, you know, this was a huge project. It took a massive team from within Perkin Elmer. So we had 85 people um, focused on this project and delivering this lab. Um, and you can see along the bottom of the screen, there's kind of a timeline of how this panned out. So you can see it was a very, very shortened timeline. Um, so originally we were talking to the, to the DHSC and Public Health Wales about, you know, how Perkin Elmer could help with the pandemic. But... Um, initially from a sort of instrumentation and kits point of view, but actually it quickly became apparent that, um, you know, the country needed a huge testing capacity that at that time, April last year, you know, wasn't really there. Um, and so we started exploring the idea of Perkin Elmore actually um, standing up and delivering two testing facilities on behalf of the DHSC. So one in Newport in Wales and one in Charmwood in England. Um, and yeah, it was a huge project. There are a lot of challenges along the way, but I think one of the things that really helped us is actually, especially with the Welsh Lab, was our strong connection with um, Public Health Wales and the DHSC and Life Science Hub Wales. So really early on, um, Public Health Wales and the DHSC worked to find us a site, um, which was in Newport. And, you know, that was great because really early on we knew where we would be, what the layout of the lab was, what we'd be walking into on day one. Um, and that really helped us. And then the other team that we worked very closely with was the NHS validation team. So they really helped us to understand right away from the beginning what we needed to deliver, when we needed to deliver it by, what that validation plan was going to look like, who we needed on board at what time. Um, and they were, they were great to work with, they were very supportive. And then in addition to challenges such as that, we also um, we had to onboard a huge number of staff. So at the Newport facility, we've now had about 300 staff that we've onboarded. Um, most of these are university graduates. This is their first job. It's their first time working in a clinical environment. Um, and we had to devise a kind of training plan that would not only get them you know, in a position where they're comfortable to run the instruments, run the tests, but actually also comfortable working in a clinical environment and understanding what the requirements are in a clinical environment and how that can actually differ from the sort of university environment and academic research labs that they're maybe more used to. Um, and then the other kind of big challenge for us was the supply chain. So obviously we saw a huge demand spike last year for everything to do with COVID diagnostics, um, instruments, reagents, everything. And pre-pandemic, um, it would normally take us eight to 12 weeks to deliver a single instrument. As you can see on the timeline along the bottom, we had to constrict that massively and our factories worked very hard to make sure that, you know, we were able to get those instruments manufactured, delivered and installed on site, ready to go. Um, and it was only through that kind of coordination throughout Perkin Elmer and with our partners in Wales that we were really able to deliver this project. And um, I think it was last Friday, the Newport Labs actually processed 2.3 million COVID samples now. So it's a, a huge effort by the team there to actually get through all those samples. And then I just, you know, wanted to end this talk by saying how much um, I think everyone at Perkin Elmer has really enjoyed this project, really enjoyed um, engaging with our partners in Wales. Um, it's been a really great introduction to the kind of Welsh genomic ecosystem. Um, and, you know, one thing we found, which I think James also highlighted, is how um, responsive people are and how quickly you can get to talking to the right person and I think that is a real part of what enabled us to succeed because there's not sort of layers of bureaucracy to fight through um, and I think you know some of the things we've really enjoyed contributing to is obviously um, we've given a lot of local university students their first jobs their first bit of experience um, in a clinical environment their first lab job and a lot of them have either progressed now, or certainly from that first cohort, either progressed now within Perkin Elmer or have moved on to other jobs in other um, labs. So that's been that's been a really nice experience for all of us. And then finally, we've also just really enjoyed um, getting the opportunity to partner with Public Health Wales. So we work really closely with them. We make sure all of our positive samples um, get across to their lab in a timely manner so they can sequence them because Wales has a really excellent COVID sequencing program. I think Wales sequenced more samples than all of France last year. 
Um, and it's nice to be able to do, you know, a small bit to be able to contribute to that effort. So thanks very much for listening to my talk. And yeah, I'd happy to take questions during the panel discussion if anyone has any. Steph, thank you very much. It was um, amazing to see how you took almost the Perkin Elmy jigsaw to make the lighthouse labs. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe in the discussion. It was certainly an experience. What made that possible? <laughs> Um, but again, really interested to see how you, you've picked, you know, how, how there's a workforce there in, in, in Wales that's coming in. Well, one just brief question, if I may, you know, you, you talked about the genomic services. Do you see that, um, that the COVID testing, you know, will fall into that genomic service as something that will stay there in perpetuity, you know, moving for sure. forward? Yeah, for sure. I think, you know, COVID's, I think we've all learned we were maybe hoping to get on holiday this year, but COVID's not going anywhere. Um, COVID testing's not going anywhere. The need to sequence isn't going anywhere. You know, when we do start opening up and we do start getting able to travel, sequencing is going to become more important than ever because it's it's the only way we can realistically open up but still manage manage the spread, manage the spread of new variants. So, yeah, for me, for sure, I think COVID is a is a long-term thing, um, for sure. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. We'll come back, I'm sure, to this more in, in our discussion in, in, a, in a few minutes. Um, right. Well, I'd, I'd like to to welcome Corinne Squire from Cardiff University, um, our final speaker in the session before we start to have a, a discussion around it. And Corinne's going to talk to us about the, the future plans for precision medicine in Wales. So I'll hand over to you, Corinne. Thanks, Steve. Um, can you see my slides? Are they up on screen? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, yeah. great. Okay, so I'm talking about precision medicine. As um, as the other speakers have said, you know, we have we have a huge amount of assets and expertise in Wales. So it's about it's about building on that. So for us, precision medicine is about using the diagnostic techniques at our disposal. And, um, and combining that information to give an accurate picture of disease and therefore what, what intervention is most appropriate to improve patient care. So there's a lot of, um, a lot of support for precision medicine from, from, uh, from, poly from political um, side and from funders. And we were very honored to, that Cardiff was recognized as a center of excellence for precision medicine by Innovate UK and that's part of UKRI. So the importance, so we have a huge array of diagnostic techniques and precision medicine is about taking that di the, uh, the digital data from diagnosis and putting it to the best use, combining these outputs to give the most accurate picture. Often this is complex data, so image data, for example, free text data, and therefore, Additional techniques are needed to analyze and make predictions on, on what, what the meaning of it all is, I suppose, in a, in a timely way. So obviously that, that analysis takes time to be, to be done manually. So we are looking at how you use um, algorithms, machine learning, AI, for example, to, um, to, make that, to make that analysis smoother and to be able to integrate different modalities of, of um, diagnostics and um, obviously the data flow within that and the, the sort of background logistics is also a huge challenge but one where I think we are managing to, to get there. Um, so this is another example for example um, showing how image data in, in cancer can be broken down in different ways and combined with genetic and clinical data to build up a, a predictive model. I'm not going to focus too much on that. I thought I would give an example from, uh, from a case study of a sort of bench to, to bedside pathway. So this was for peritoneal dialysis, which is a, it's a treatment for kidney failure. So there's a little bit of background. Fluids inserted into the perineum, waste products filter out across intestinal membranes and the waste fluids removed. So, you, so these sort of techniques, as with any catheterized procedure, really carries a high risk of infection. 
So you can see a peritoneal dialysis bag on the left there. That's what it should look like, nice, clear, straw-colored liquid. On the right, that is an acute case of bacterial peritonitis. And um, you could say, well, why do we need a diagnosis? You can clearly see what the difference is there. I think the problem is that um, that infection can be extremely serious, even life-threatening. So this is, these are survival curves for different pathogens um, causing peritoneal dialysis. So obviously, the sooner you can diagnose that, the, uh, the earlier you can treat and the better the outcomes for the patient. And if you know what the infection is, you can obviously tailor that appro uh, treatment appropriately. So diagnosis formally was looking at microbiological samples. So if you get growth, you can see it. But is it disease or is it contamination? And if there's nothing there, does that tell you that it's not, there is nothing there or that it just hasn't grown in the conditions that you've given it? So it's, it's inconclusive. So in the absence of, of rapid diagnostics, treatment of infections is largely empir empirical and based on best clinical judgment. This is a statement from the MRC below saying a, a growing proportion of diagnostic tests will be based on the assessment of numerous markers. So this is talking about different classes of biomarkers. And what we've looked at in this example is the host response to an immune, um, through, to a pathogen, so a response to infection. So different pathogens um, cause the body to react in different ways. So working back from what is produced by the body, you can work out what the what the infection is and how it's um, how that response is giving you information on what the infection is. So, in, for example, in a, in a peritoneal dialysis bag, you have a whole concoction of different types of molecules. And analyzing these biomarkers will give you a whole list of patterns. So you can see there cluster analysis of biomarkers for acute infection in peritoneal dialysis. And you can clearly see there are patterns there. But, uh, but working out which are the most, um, most appropriate, most di diagnostically relevant biomarker signatures out of, that, uh, out of that mix is where, again, the machine learning comes in to, uh, to cut that down. To, um, to a manageable number. So if you look at the, uh, the graph on the top left there, you can see that a few well-chosen biomarkers can be as effective as, as 50, for example. The next graph shows that you um, can not only show whether you have an infection, you can tell what type of infection it is. So once you have a reliable rapid diagnostic test to use it, you need to be able to deploy that clinically. So you need to make a system that will either work on a, uh, a large lab-based high-throughput um, platform, such as on the left there, or in this case, um, we have a what everyone's now familiar with, a lateral flow test. Um, so this one was made by Melogic and is obviously um, uh, optimized for peritoneal dialysis fluid. So that's now being used and uh, as in, in use actually diagnosing infection. So it's great to see that pathway go all the way through, you know, working with the NHS, working with industrial partners to, um, to get a product right the way through to development. Uh, we have another project underway um, in immune fingerprinting with the Accelerate program with Siemens. So similar, similar idea, but looking at post-surgery and anastomotic leaks following bowel surgery. So that's when a section of bowel has been removed and, uh, and rejoined. Obviously, if there are any, any leaks in that system, that can cause infection very quickly. Um, and we've discovered that with this system, you can pick up that infection almost straight away. So it's, um, it's very effective for post-surgery screening. Um, I'd like to say our surgeons in Cardiff are all very accomplished, so we get very few leaks, but uh, there's, uh, Having that, having that reassurance, make sure that uh, that if there if there is a need for antibiotic treatment, that takes place straight away. So finally, this is about our plans for the future. So we have um, we have, as I've said, a lot of assets, a lot of expertise, but they're highly multidisciplinary and spread all over the place. So there are there are pockets of um, of excellence within biology, chemistry, medicine, physics, maths, computer science, um, I would say psychology, mental health as well. So 
bringing bringing those um, those pockets of expertise together, I think, will will be the way to really move forward programs within Wales. Um, It'll involve cl working closely with um, with clinical colleagues. So, as I've said, working with our NHS partners. So, particularly within within South East Wales, but wider as well. And because of the the importance of, of data flows and the the um, background IT systems, obviously the just logistics and IT and our NHS partners as well. Um, it involves working with companies to produce clinically useful products. So that's translating innova innovations from academia, but also from industry as well, to create better techniques to diagnose and treat disease. Um, so we're working hard on, on um, ha well, creating a, a centre of, of, of excellence for precision medicine within Wales. And um, I think that's, uh, that's something that's, that's both a, an ambition, but currently underway. So there are, there are already a lot of programmes in operation and a lot of projects that are going on and uh, as well as having some um, some excellent things coming through the pipeline so i will stop there and um hope to join all the others i hope that was a, a quick whistle top stop whistle stop tour <laughs> great that, thanks Corinne. That, that's that's really interesting i particularly like the, the case studies that you gave around the um, you know, the, the rapid detection of microbes in, in both, you know, the, the surgical, but also the, you know, the, the, the kind of systemic infection case as well. It's really nice. I'll go back to what I said at the beginning. You know, Wales has a precision medicine program. And, and I think what's exciting about it is, you know, it's driven by NHS Wales as the single healthcare provider for the nation. And you can see the activities that have happened as kind of acute responses under that and you know the type of um, work that Steph's been really involved in, the longer term ambitions that Corinne and I have spoken about and the international collaborations that James has spoken about. I want to kick off a, a discussion for our, our remaining time and hopefully everybody will stick around to to, to hear what um, colleagues who've joined the um, opinions are. I'd, I'd like to come to, to Steph if I can first. I mean, you talked about all the divisions of, of Perkin Elma. You, you can do picking and choosing, I suppose, the bits that you needed, all you know, down to turning around the speed of which you manufactured equipment. And but I, what, what I'd like today is, is, is almost take a, a step above that to the organizational response and say, you know, how did such a large organization as Perkin Elma be so agile in, in this response? You know, really, because you talked about it and you know in terms of we did it we decided to do it but but how you know because you, you're huge <laughs> yeah i think um i think we were all all also amazed at how we managed to actually deliver it i think um we're very lucky in that we're an organization where people are allowed to make decisions um and people are also allowed to make the wrong decisions and that's fine and you know if there's a problem we'll we'll solve it I think that general attitude of, yeah, if there's a problem, we will solve it, meant that actually <clears throat> at every level in that project team, so there are 85 people and a lot of people had to make a lot of decisions that maybe they didn't know everything about, maybe they, you know, wasn't their area of expertise, but the only way we were ever going to set up such a big testing capable lab in three months was by people just going for it. And I think, um, yeah, we're very lucky that we work in that environment. And then on top of that, you know, right at the start of the year, um, our R&D team actually developed a testing kit. I think we were the second or third to get FDA approval. Um, so right at the start of the year, when people were first becoming aware of COVID, um, as a company, the decision was made, you know, this is an area we can have an impact in. This is where we want to, you know, we want to be able to help people by going through this. and. So everyone's focus was very much on how can we help, how can we deliver this? And yeah, that huge team were able to dedicate their time to working mm. on this project, which I think, you know, for somewhere like the NHS, which has got the day-to-day -day service they deliver, people can't stop doing that. They still have to do their day job. That's that's what makes it very difficult for them to react to something like this. Whereas we were all able to drop our day jobs 
I focus solely on this and then go back to our day jobs afterwards. So, but yeah, it was, it was an amazing project to work on. And, and will it, will it change the way in which Perkin Elmer operates as a company now? Do you think you'll, you'll stay you know, in this rapid turnaround dynamic or do you think you need to slow up a bit? To, so you can not do a better job, but you not have to rush. Uh, I think it will. I think it will change things. I don't think salespeople will accept the factory telling them there's going to be a delay on delivering things to their customers anymore. Um, but yeah, I think I think every every single company has probably discovered a lot of things they can do that they maybe did, didn't necessarily think they can do. Even like you know, our IT department rolled out Teams in a month. Normally, rolling out a new IT project takes months. It's. I think every company's realised what they can do um when the pressure's on and yeah i think a lot of those learnings are going to be incorporated into how we work and how we respond to new challenges great thanks james i want to come to you if I can, and ask you know, a similar sort of question but you, you have probably uh, amongst this panel quite a a global perspective certainly working across well i mean i would say very wealthy nations but also you know, less wealthy nations where you know, the, the impact of what we've seen over the past 18 months has, has you know, been equally, um, you know, kind of e had an equal effect. So how have you seen nations responding? You know, do you think some have done it better than others? Or do you think they've all come together to do it well? Yeah, Steve, that's a really, really good question. And, and one that's highly debated over here. Um, you know, I, I would say that we learned a lot. And I think Stephanie kind of put a nice little twist on it because we had to move we had to move very quickly in relationship to what was needed. And we had to pull things together where we they were all bespoke. So more so you had to pull your internal national pieces together that probably weren't talking to one another that needed to. And more complex here in the States because of course we have the individualized states and then we have the national front. So you have those pieces. But then we also had those global perspectives, the so WHO, all those organizations that, of course, had those connections before with Ebola and other infectious diseases or H1N1 or H1N5, but yet weren't functional. And I think that that's one of the criticalities that we ran into was how do you functionalize those things at a global scale to allow for, for this, the collaborations to occur? Um, and when you look at it and take it from that and you drill down on it, you look and see what the UK did. And I'd have to say, I, I really commend the UK as a whole in relationship to what it did because it rapidly scaled quickly. It went straight into genomics. It started testing and, and right away, the variant information that came out went from China to UK. And, and that right there was really important because the, the public health system in the UK put it out there and with that, People like Stephanie Perkin or PPD and the others were able to not only get the data that was required to spin up the diagnostics that were needed, but then started talking with each other. And, and I, I can say that uh, in my experience of working with people like PPD, they only had two weeks to get something set up where they never had done anything like it before. And they were testing these devices, the, the rapid lateral flow devices for approvals for people. Uh, we didn't do that before. And so you've got to move very quickly. And what it really did for us, I think, as a whole globally, is really highlighted the need for the connections, the need for the dialogue, the need for the collaborations. And, and I do think, you know, to Stephanie's point, I do think that organizations and countries are going to have to um, start working more closely together. Granted, you have national interests, of course, that, that are important. And you also have to have the ability to take care of your own country and the populace in your country. So over here, we have the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority stood up back in 2010. And that was for H1N1 to produce you know, mm -hmm. biomedical countermeasures and stockpiles. What did we do? We ran through it all. Where were we getting it from? It, we're getting it from everywhere. It was all shipping in, like Stephanie said. The delay was in, when are we getting the trucks? When are the things rolling in? It became a logistical challenge. And so what have we had to do now is we've now invested nationally and internationally for our, I would say, our health alliances to invest and develop those countermeasures or those stockpiles internally. And you look at the UK, the opportunity sits there for that to occur but really set up a precedent because of the Commonwealth and the needs of the Commonwealth and the requirements of the Commonwealth because they're scaled a little bit differently. 
And I think that's really the, a key opportunity. Another thing that I highlighted was the laboratories. So the national and international laboratory networks, the ability to collaborate between those had been sent, uh, the seed had been planted ages ago. And now we see more integration, those laboratories working together. So we're speeding up and being able to transfer that information relating to the new variants and, and to the diagnostics needed for that. So hopefully, you know, if I if I talk about five years from now, my hope is that we'll have a more strategic, more aligned collaborative framework between industry, academia, and uh, government, because they now understand they're going to have to be prepared for the next one. And I think that's the criticality of what we're talking about today. Fantastic. Thanks, James. Mm -hmm. and Karina, I, I want to come to you with a similar sort of partnership question. You know, the case studies you gave us were about the partnerships between um, academia and the NHS. Could you comment yeah. how you know, critical, you know, and what, what are the critical parts of, of those collaborations? Because you know, we're, we're treating the patients of these clinicians, we're driving through new technologies, but you know, how, do, how does that work in the types of studies you were talking to us about? Yeah, thanks. Um, I think it's it's finding um, find. I mean, the clinicians are always very keen to have the latest for their patients. Obviously, new techniques um, that that promise better treatments for their patients. They're always very keen to get that going. I think what what sometimes happens is though that the systems aren't aren't ready to receive those those new things. So being able to get the sort of background. Um, IT partnerships in place and um, as you said the, the right techniques so thinking about where your intervention sits in the patient pathway is also is also critical so that you know that there is a place where this where this intervention is going to sit and um, and being able to put that in place so that it fits with the systems we've got and doesn't sort of add a add another layer of complexity into into treating a patient so that it's it's simple and accessible and fits within what we're already doing. So in a lot of cases, it's, it's for example, looking at um, blood tests in, that are done for cancer. What information can you get from those blood tests? You've already got the information, but it's, it's, it's only giving you, you know, so much, like this, this person needs looking at further. So they go into the two week wait program, for example. And um, as, as we're all probably aware, you know, there are now huge backlogs in that system. Can you, for example, stratify that waiting list so that those who are, who are higher risk are picked out with the information you've got? So we've been working with a, with a company in Leeds that have got a, an intervention there for, uh, for stratifying waiting lists, looking at the, um, the information from blood, from blood tests that have already been taken. So that you can say whether somebody needs to be seen urgently or less urgently, and in the system that the, you know, in the situation we've got now, that's that's urgently needed. Um, so I think it's that there are just so many examples of that where um, you know there's a there's a need for it, there's a niche for it, and it's um, it's getting the right people in, into the room, I suppose, to to make it happen. Um, right. Yeah, and uh, and I think. The NHS is in a more collaborative space now than it has ever been. I think they are quite, quite um, you know, open, quite willing to uh, to take innovations from other places, be it academia or industry. I think they're they're really looking for things that can you know help them do things in a different way, yeah. and with patients having you know taken that step into you know new new ways of doing things that don't involve the sort of traditional see a specialist or see a GP, see a specialist pathway. I think that it's, it's a good time to try new things. Great. Thanks, Kareen. Well, in, in our final minute, I'd, I'd just like to close with the, probably the shortest answer I'll ever make to this question is, what does success look like in five years' time for Wales? And what do we need in place to deliver it? Well, I think we have it in place. We have a precision medicine initiative that's government-led. I think we've got partnerships with businesses, we've got partnerships with academia, we've got global partnerships. I think all those have to be in place. Where would I like to be? I'd like to see Wales leading and not catching up. I'd like to see Wales doing things first and giving those benefits to the, the people of the Welsh nation and handing them out to the people across the world. So 
on that very positive note, I'd like to um, say a great thank you to Corrine, to James and Steph for joining this afternoon and to everybody who's joined us in the meeting. So thank you and, and goodbye. Thanks. 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 Thank you. Thank you for watching. Rewatch all of our sessions online. Thank you to our partners.